Section 16 of The Theory of Moral Sentiments. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ariadna Solovyova. The Theory of Moral Sentiments by Adam Smith. Part three of the foundation of our judgments concerning our own sentiments and conduct, and of the sense of duty, consisting of one section. Chapter three of the influences and authority of conscience. But though the approbation of his own conscience can scarce, upon some extraordinary occasions, content the weakness of man, though the testimony of the supposed impartial spectator of the great inmate of the breast cannot always alone support him. Yet the influence and authority of this principle is upon all occasions very great, and it is only by consulting this judge within that we can ever see what relates to ourselves in its proper shape and dimensions, or that we can ever make any proper comparison between our own interests and those of other people. As to the eye of the body, objects appear great or small, not so much according to their real dimensions, as according to the nearness or distance of their situation. So do they likewise to what may be called the natural eye of the mind. And we remedy the defects of both these organs pretty much in the same manner. In my present situation, an immense landscape of lawns and woods and distant mountains seems to do no more than cover the little window which I ride by, and to be out of all proportion less than the chamber in which I am sitting. I can form a just comparison between those great objects and the little objects around me, in no other way than by transporting myself, at least in fancy, to a different station from whence I can survey both at nearly equal distances, and thereby form some judgment of their real proportions. Habit and experience have taught me to do this so easily and so readily that I am scarce sensible that I do it, and a man must be in some measure acquainted with the philosophy of vision before he can be thoroughly convinced how little those distant objects would appear to the eye if the imagination, from a knowledge of their real magnitudes, did not swell and dilate them. In the same manner, to the selfish and original passions of human nature, the loss or gain of a very small interest of our own appears to be of vastly more importance, excites a much more passionate joy or sorrow, a much more ardent desire or aversion, than the greatest concern of another with whom we have no particular connection. His interests, as long as they are surveyed from this station, can never be put into the balance with our own, can never restrain us from doing whatever may tend to promote our own. How ruinous soever to him! Before we can make any proper comparison of those opposite interests, we must change our position. We must view them neither from our own place, nor yet from his, neither with our own eyes, nor yet with his, but from the place and with the eyes of a third person, who has no particular connection with either, and who judges with impartiality between us. Here, too, habit and experience have taught us to do this so easily and so readily that we are scarce sensible that we do it. And it requires, in this case, too, some degree of reflection, and even of philosophy, to convince us how little interest we should take in the greatest concerns of our neighbor, how little we should be affected by whatever relates to him if the sense of propriety and justice did not correct the otherwise natural inequality of our sentiments. Let us suppose that the great empire of China, with all its myriads of inhabitants, was suddenly swallowed up by an earthquake, and let us consider how a man of humanity in Europe, who had no sort of connection with that part of the world, would be affected upon receiving intelligence of this dreadful calamity. 
he would i imagine first of all express very strongly his sorrow for the misfortune of that unhappy people he would make many melancholy reflections upon the precariousness of human life and the vanity of all the labors of man which could thus be annihilated in a moment he would too perhaps if he was a man of speculation enter into many reasonings concerning the effects which this disaster might produce upon the commerce of europe and the trade and business of the world in general and when all this fine philosophy was over when all these humane sentiments had been once fairly expressed he would pursue his business or his pleasure take his repose or his diversion with the same ease and tranquillity as if no such accident had happened the most frivolous disaster which could befall himself would occasion a more real disturbance if he was to lose his little finger to-morrow he would not sleep to-night but provided he never saw them he will snore with the most profound security over the ruin of a hundred millions of his brethren and the destruction of that immense multitude seems plainly an object less interesting to him than this paltry misfortune of his own to prevent therefore this paltry misfortune to himself would a man of humanity be willing to sacrifice the lives of a hundred millions of his brethren provided he had never seen them human nature startles with horror at the thought and the world in its greatest depravity and corruption never produced such a villain as could be capable of entertaining it but what makes this difference when our passive feelings are almost always so sordid and so selfish how comes it that our active principles should often be so generous and so noble when we are always so much more deeply affected by whatever concerns ourselves than by whatever concerns other men what is it which prompts the generous upon all occasions and the mean upon many to sacrifice their own interests to the greater interests of others it is not the soft power of humanity it is not that feeble spirit of benevolence which nature has lighted up in the human heart that is thus capable of counteracting the strongest impulses of self-love it is a stronger power a more forcible motive which exerts itself upon such occasions it is reason principle conscience the inhabitant of the breast the man within the great judge and arbiter of our conduct it is he who whenever we are about to act so as to affect the happiness of others calls to us with a voice capable of astonishing the most presumptuous of our passions that we are but one of the multitude in no respect better than any other in it and that when we prefer ourselves so shamefully and so blindly to others we become the proper objects of resentment abhorrence and execration it is from him only that we learn the real littleness of ourselves and of whatever relates to ourselves and the natural misrepresentation of self-love can be corrected only by the eye of this impartial spectator it is he who shows us the propriety of generosity and the deformity of injustice the propriety of resigning the greatest interests of our own for the yet greater interests of others and the deformity of doing the smallest injury to another in order to obtain the greatest benefit to ourselves it is not the love of our neighbor it is not the love of mankind which upon many occasions prompts us to the practice of those divine virtues it is a stronger love a more powerful affection which generally takes place upon such occasions the love of what is honorable and noble of the grandeur and dignity and superiority of our own characters when the happiness or misery of others depends in any respect upon our conduct we dare not as self-love might suggest to us prefer the interest of one to that of many the man within immediately calls to us that we value ourselves too much and other people too little and that by doing so we render ourselves the proper object of the contempt and indignation of our brethren neither is this sentiment confined to men of extraordinary magnanimity and virtue it is deeply impressed upon every tolerably good soldier who feels that he would become the scorn of his companions if he could be supposed capable of shrinking from danger or of hesitating either to expose or to throw away his life when the good of the service required it one individual must never prefer himself so much even to any other individual as to hurt or injure that other in order to benefit himself 
though the benefit to the one should be much greater than the hurt or injury to the other. The poor man must neither defraud nor steal from the rich, though the acquisition might be much more beneficial to the one than the loss could be hurtful to the other. The man within immediately calls to him, in this case too, that he is no better than his neighbor, and that by this unjust preference he renders himself the proper object of the contempt and indignation of mankind, as well as of the punishment which that contempt and indignation must naturally dispose them to inflict, for having thus violated one of those sacred rules upon the tolerable observation of which depend the whole security and peace of human society. There is no commonly honest man who does not more dread the inward disgrace of such an action, the indelible stain which it would forever stamp upon his own mind, than the greatest external calamity, which without any fault of his own could possibly befall him, and who does not inwardly feel the truth of that great stoical maxim, that for one man to deprive another unjustly of anything, or unjustly to promote his own advantage by the loss or disadvantage of another, is more contrary to nature than death, than poverty, than pain, than all the misfortunes which can affect him, either in his body or in his external circumstances. When the happiness or misery of others indeed in no respect depends upon our conduct, when our interests are altogether separated and detached from theirs, so that there is neither connection nor competition between them, we do not always think it so necessary to restrain either our natural and perhaps improper anxiety about our own affairs, or our natural and perhaps equally improper indifference about those of other men. The most vulgar education teaches us to act upon all important occasions with some sort of impartiality between ourselves and others, and even the ordinary commerce of the world is capable of adjusting our active principles to some degree of propriety but it is the most artificial and refined education only, it has been said, which can correct the inequalities of our passive feelings, and we must for this purpose, it has been pretended, have recourse to the severest as well as to the profoundest philosophy. Two different sets of philosophers have attempted to teach us this hardest of all the lessons of morality. One set have labored to increase our sensibility to the interests of others, another to diminish that to our own. The first would have us feel for others as we naturally feel for ourselves. The second would have us feel for ourselves as we naturally feel for others. Both, perhaps, have carried their doctrines a good deal beyond the just standard of nature and propriety. The first are those whiny and melancholy moralists who are perpetually reproaching us with our happiness while so many of our brethren are in misery, who regard as impious the natural joy of prosperity, which does not think of the many wretches that are at every instant laboring under all sorts of calamities, in the languor of poverty, in the agony of disease, in the horrors of death, under the insults and oppression of their enemies. Commiseration for those miseries which we never saw, which we never heard of, but which we may be assured are at all times infesting such numbers of our fellow creatures, ought they think to damp the pleasures of the fortunate, and to render a certain melancholy dejection habitual to all men. But first of all, this extreme sympathy with misfortunes which we know nothing about seems altogether absurd and unreasonable. Take the whole earth at an average, for one man who suffers pain or misery you will find twenty in prosperity and joy, or at least in tolerable circumstances. No reason surely can be assigned why we should rather weep with the one than rejoice with the twenty. This artificial commiseration, besides, is not only absurd, but seems altogether unattainable, and those who affect this character have commonly nothing but a certain affected and sentimental sadness, which without reaching the heart serves only to render the countenance and conversation impertinently dismal and disagreeable. And last of all, this disposition of mind, though it could be attained, would be perfectly useless, and could serve no other purpose than to render miserable the person who possessed it. 
whatever interest we take in the fortune of those with whom we have no acquaintance or connection, and who are placed altogether out of the sphere of our activity, can produce only anxiety in ourselves without any manner of advantage to them. To what purpose should we trouble ourselves about the world in the moon? All men, even those at the greatest distance, are no doubt entitled to our good wishes, and our good wishes we naturally give them. But if notwithstanding they should be unfortunate, to give ourselves any anxiety upon that account seems to be no part of our duty. That we should be but little interested, therefore, in the fortune of those whom we can neither serve nor hurt, and who are in every respect so very remote from us, seems wisely ordered by nature. And if it were possible to alter in this respect the original constitution of our frame, we could yet gain nothing by the change. It is never objected to us that we have too little fellow-feeling with the joy of success. Wherever envy does not prevent it, the favor which we bear to prosperity is rather apt to be too great, and the same moralists who blame us for want of sufficient sympathy with the miserable reproach us for the levity with which we are too apt to admire and almost to worship the fortunate, the powerful, and the rich. Among the moralists who endeavor to correct the natural inequality of our passive feelings by diminishing our sensibility to what peculiarly concerns ourselves, we may count all the ancient sects of philosophers, but particularly the ancient Stoics. Man, according to the Stoics, ought to regard himself not as something separated and detached, but as a citizen of the world, a member of the vast commonwealth of nature. To the interest of this great community he ought at all times to be willing that his own little interest should be sacrificed. Whatever concerns himself ought to affect him no more than whatever concerns any other equally important part of this immense system. We should view ourselves not in the light in which our own selfish passions are apt to place us, but in the light in which any other citizen of the world would view us. What befalls ourselves we should regard as what befalls our neighbor, or what comes to the same thing as our neighbor regards what befalls us. When our neighbor, says Epictetus, loses his wife or his son, there is nobody who is not sensible that this is a human calamity, a natural event altogether according to the ordinary course of things. But when the same thing happens to ourselves, then we cry out as if we had suffered the most dreadful misfortune. We ought, however, to remember how we were affected when this accident happened to another, and such as we were in his case, such ought we to be in our own. Those private misfortunes, for which our feelings are apt to go beyond the bounds of propriety, are of two different kinds. They are either such as affect us only indirectly, by affecting, in the first place, some other persons who are particularly dear to us, such as our parents, our children, our brothers and sisters, our intimate friends, or they are such as affect ourselves immediately and directly, either in our body, in our fortune, or in our reputation such as pain, sickness, approaching death, poverty, disgrace, etc. In misfortunes of the first kind, our emotions may no doubt go very much beyond what exact propriety will admit of, but they may likewise fall short of it, and they frequently do so. The man who should feel no more for the death or distress of his own father or son than for those of any other man's father or son, would appear neither a good son nor a good father. Such unnatural indifference, far from exciting our applause, would incur our highest disapprobation. Of those domestic affections, however, some are most apt to offend by their excess, and others by their defect. Nature, for the wisest purposes, has rendered in most men, perhaps in all men, parental tenderness a much stronger affection than filial piety. The continuance and propagation of the species depend altogether upon the former, and not upon the latter. In ordinary cases, the existence and preservation of the child depend altogether upon the care of the parents. Those of the parents seldom depend upon that of the child. Nature, therefore, 
has rendered the former affection so strong that it generally requires not to be excited but to be moderated and moralists seldom endeavor to teach us how to indulge but generally how to restrain our fondness our excessive attachment the unjust preference which we are disposed to give to our own children above those of other people they exhort us on the contrary to an affectionate attention to our parents and to make a proper return to them in their old age for the kindness which they had shown to us in our infancy and youth in the decalogue we are commanded to honor our fathers and mothers no mention is made of the love of our children nature had sufficiently prepared us for the performance of this latter duty men are seldom accused of affecting to be fonder of their children than they really are they have sometimes been suspected of displaying their piety to their parents with too much ostentation the ostentatious sorrow of widows has for a like reason been suspected of insincerity we should respect could we believe it sincere even the excess of such kind affections and though we might not perfectly approve we should not severely condemn it that it appears praiseworthy at least in the eyes of those who affect it the very affectation is a proof even the excess of those kind affections which are most apt to offend by their excess though it may appear blamable never appears odious we blame the excessive fondness and anxiety of a parent as something which may in the end prove hurtful to the child and which in the meantime is excessively inconvenient to the parent but we easily pardon it and never regard it with hatred and detestation but the defect of this usually excessive affection appears always peculiarly odious the man who appears to feel nothing for his own children but who treats them upon all occasions with unmerited severity and harshness seems of all brutes the most detestable the sense of propriety so far from requiring us to eradicate altogether that extraordinary sensibility which we naturally feel for the misfortunes of our nearest connections is always much more offended by the defect than it ever is by the excess of that sensibility the stoical apathy is in such cases never agreeable and all the metaphysical sophisms by which it is supported can seldom serve any other purpose than to blow up the hard insensibility of a coxcomb to ten times its native impertinence the poets and romance writers who best paint the refinements and delicacies of love and friendship and of all other private and domestic affections racine and voltaire richardson moriveau and riccoboni are in such cases much better instructors than zeno chrysippus or epictetus that moderated sensibility to the misfortunes of others which does not disqualify us for the performance of any duty the melancholy and affectionate remembrance of our departed friends the pang as gray says to secret sorrow dear are by no means undelicious sensations though they outwardly wear the features of pain and grief they are all inwardly stamped with the ennobling characters of virtue and self-approbation it is otherwise in the misfortunes which affect ourselves immediately and directly either in our body in our fortune or in our reputation the sense of propriety is much more apt to be offended by the excess than by the defect of our sensibility and there are but very few cases in which we can approach too near to the stoical apathy and indifference that we have very little fellow feeling with any of the passions which take their origin from the body has already been observed that pain which is occasioned by an evident cause such as the cutting or tearing of the flesh is perhaps the affection of the body with which the spectator feels the most lively sympathy the approaching death of his neighbor too seldom fails to affect him a good deal in both cases however he feels so very little in comparison of what the person principally concerned feels that the latter can scarce ever offend the former by appearing to suffer with too much ease the mere want of fortune mere poverty excites little compassion its complaints are too apt to be the objects rather of contempt than of fellow-feeling 
we despise a beggar, and though his importunities may extort an alms from us, he is scarce ever the object of any serious commiseration. The fall from riches to poverty, as it commonly occasions the most real distress to the sufferer, so it seldom fails to excite the most sincere commiseration in the spectator, though in the present state of society this misfortune can seldom happen without some misconduct, and some very considerable misconduct, too, in the sufferer. Yet he is almost always so much pitied that he is scarce ever allowed to fall into the lowest state of poverty. But by the means of his friends, frequently by the indulgence of those very creditors, who have much reason to complain of his imprudence, is almost always supported in some degree of decent, though humble, mediocrity. To persons under such misfortunes we could perhaps easily pardon some degree of weakness. But at the same time they who carry the firmest countenance, who accommodate themselves with the greatest ease to their new situation, who seem to feel no humiliation from the change, but to rest their rank in the society, not upon their fortune, but upon their character and conduct, are always the most approved of, and never fail to command our highest and most affectionate admiration. As of all the external misfortunes which can affect an innocent man immediately and directly, the undeserved loss of reputation is certainly the greatest. So a considerable degree of sensibility to whatever can bring on so great a calamity does not always appear ungraceful or disagreeable. We often esteem a young man the more when he resents, though with some degree of violence, any unjust reproach that may have been thrown upon his character or his honor. The affliction of an innocent young lady on account of the, of the groundless surmises which may have been circulated concerning her conduct appears often perfectly amiable. Persons of an advanced age whom long experience of the folly and injustice of the world has taught to pay little regard, either to its censure or to its applause, neglect and despise obloquy, and do not even deign to honor its futile authors with any serious resentment. This indifference, which is founded altogether on a firm confidence in their own well-tried and well-established character, would be disagreeable in young people, who neither can nor ought to have any such confidence. It might in them be supposed to forebode, in their advancing years, almost improper insensibility to real honor and infamy. In all other private misfortunes, which affect ourselves immediately and directly, we can very seldom offend by appearing to be too little affected. We frequently remember our sensibility to the misfortunes of others with pleasure and satisfaction. We can seldom remember that to our own, without some degree of shame and humiliation. If we examine the different shades and gradations of weakness and self-command, as we meet with them in common life, we shall very easily satisfy ourselves that this control of our passive feelings must be acquired not from the abstruse syllogisms of a quibbling dialectic, but from that great discipline which nature has established for the acquisition of this and of every other virtue, a regard to the sentiments of the real or supposed spectator of our conduct. A very young child has no self-command, but whatever are its emotions, whether fear or grief or anger, it endeavors always by the violence of its outcries to alarm as much as it can the attention of its nurse or of its parents. While it remains under the custody of such partial protectors, its anger is the first and perhaps the only passion which it is taught to moderate. By noise and threatening, they are, for their own ease, often obliged to frighten it into good temper, and the passion which incites it to attack is restrained by that which teaches it to attend to its own safety. When it is old enough to go to school or to mix with its equals, it soon finds that they have no such indulgent partiality. It naturally wishes to gain their favor and to avoid their hatred or contempt. Regard even to its own safety teaches it to do so, 
and it soon finds that it can do so in no other way than by moderating not only its anger but all its other passions to the degree which its playfellows and companions are likely to be pleased with it thus enters into the great school of self-command it studies to be more and more master of itself and begins to exercise over its own feelings a discipline which the practice of the longest life is very seldom sufficient to bring to complete perfection. In all private misfortunes, in pain, in sickness, in sorrow, the weakest man, when his friend, and still more when a stranger visits him, is immediately impressed with the view in which they are likely to look upon his situation. Their view calls off his attention from his own view, and his breast is in some measure be calmed the moment they come into his presence. This effect is produced instantaneously, and as it were mechanically, but with a weak man it is not of long continuance. His own view of his situation immediately recurs upon him. He abandons himself as before to sighs and tears of lamentations, and endeavors like a child that has not yet gone to school to produce some sort of harmony between his own grief and the compassion of the spectator, not by moderating the former, but by importunately calling upon the latter. With a man of a little more firmness, the effect is somewhat more permanent. He endeavors, as much as he can, to fix his attention upon the view which the company are likely to take of his situation. He feels, at the same time, the esteem and approbation which they naturally conceive for him when he thus preserves his tranquillity, and though under the pressure of some recent and great calamity appears to feel for himself no more than what they really feel for him. He approves and applauds himself by sympathy with their approbation. And the pleasure which he derives from this sentiment supports and enables him more easily to continue this generous effort. In most cases he avoids mentioning his own misfortune, and his company, if they are tolerably well-bred, are careful to say nothing which can put him in mind of it. He endeavors to entertain them, in his usual way, upon indifferent subjects, or if he feels himself strong enough to venture to mention his misfortune, he endeavors to talk of it as he thinks they are capable of talking of it, and even to feel it no further than they are capable of feeling it. If he has not, however, been well inured to the hard discipline of self-command, he soon grows weary of this restraint. A long visit fatigues him, and towards the end of it he is constantly in danger of doing what he never fails to do the moment it is over, of abandoning himself to all the weakness of excessive sorrow. Modern good manners, which are extremely indulgent to human weakness, forbid, for some time, the visits of strangers to persons under great family distress, and permit those only of the nearest relations and most intimate friends. The presence of the latter, it is thought, will impose less restraint than that of the former, and the sufferers can more easily accommodate themselves to the feelings of those from whom they have reason to expect a more indulgent sympathy. Secret enemies, who fancy that they are not known to be such, are frequently fond of making those charitable visits as early as the most intimate friends. The weakest man in the world, in this case, endeavors to support his manly countenance, and from indignation and contempt of their malice, to behave with as much gaiety and ease as he can. The man of real constancy and firmness, the wise and just man, who has been thoroughly bred in the great school of self-command, in the bustle and business of the world, exposed perhaps to the violence and injustice of faction, and to the hardships and hazards of war, maintains this control of his passive feelings upon all occasions, and whether in solitude or in society, wears nearly the same countenance, and is affected very nearly in the same manner. In success and in disappointment, in prosperity and in adversity, before friends and before enemies, he has often been under the necessity of supporting this manhood. He has never dared to forget for one moment the judgment which the impartial spectator would pass upon his sentiments and conduct. He has never dared to suffer the man within the breast to be absent one moment from his attention. With the eyes of this great inmate he has always been accustomed to regard whatever relates to himself. 
this habit has become perfectly familiar to him. He has been in the constant practice, and indeed under the constant necessity of modeling, or of endeavoring to model, not only his outward conduct and behavior, but as much as he can, even his inward sentiments and feelings, according to those of this awful and respectable judge. He does not merely affect the sentiments of the impartial spectator. He really adopts them. He almost identifies himself with, he almost becomes himself that impartial spectator, and scarce even feels but as that great arbiter of his conduct directs him to feel. The degree of the self-approbation with which every man, upon such occasions, surveys his own conduct, is higher or lower exactly in proportion to the degree of self-command which is necessary in order to obtain that self-approbation. Where little self-command is necessary, little self-approbation is due. The man who has only scratched his finger cannot much applaud himself, though he should immediately appear to have forgot this paltry misfortune. The man who has lost his leg by a cannon shot, and who the moment after speaks and acts with his usual coolness and tranquillity, as he exerts a much higher degree of self-command, so he naturally feels a much higher degree of self-approbation. With most men, upon such an accident, their own natural view of their own misfortune would force itself upon them with such a vivacity and strength of colouring as would entirely face all thought of every other view. They would feel nothing, they could attend to nothing but their own pain and their own fear, and not only the judgment of the ideal man within the breast, but that of the real spectator who might happen to be present would be entirely overlooked and disregarded. The reward which nature bestows upon good behavior under misfortune is thus exactly proportioned to the degree of that good behavior. The only compensation she could possibly make for the bitterness of pain and distress is thus to, in equal degrees of good behavior, exactly proportioned to the degree of that pain and distress. In proportion to the degree of the self-command which is necessary in order to conquer our natural sensibility, the pleasure and pride of the conquest are so much the greater, and this pleasure and pride are so great that no man can be altogether unhappy who completely enjoys them. Misery and wretchedness can never enter the breast in which dwells complete self-satisfaction, and though it may be too much perhaps to say with the Stoics that under such an accident as that above mentioned the happiness of a wise man is in every respect equal to what it could have been under any other circumstances. Yet it must be acknowledged, at least, that this complete enjoyment of his own self-applause, though it may not altogether extinguish, must certainly very much alleviate his sense of his own sufferings. End of section 16 Recorded by Ariadna Solovyova